Emerging from Naughty Dog as one of the top gaming mascots of the industry in the mid-1990s, Crash Bandicoot made quite a first impression with its colorful worlds and satisfying gameplay. However, it was dragged down by its underwhelming boss battles, ludicrous save methods, and difficulty spikes. Over the next year, Naughty Dog worked rigorously, refining the formula to a T with tighter controls, new moves, more level variety, and a stronger soundtrack to boot, creating arguably one of the greatest PlayStation sequels ever, despite the bosses still being pretty trash. A little over two years after the level blower dickhead marsupial's debut on the Playbox, Crash Bandicoot was released to the public promoting a time travel adventure with several new gameplay styles, including a Yoshi cameo, playing with his sister, new powers, new villains, and more Clancy Brown than even your wildest dreams could hope for. But would Naughty Dog's renovations to the classic Crash formula be the cherry on top of the Crash trilogy? Yes, what kind of dumb question is that? Did you hear me? There's more Clancy Brown! Look, 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 he plays this evil talking board who is Cortex's boss? When was it ever hinted at that Cortex was working under someone? This is just kind of shoehorned in here as a means to progress the plot, and I just... Whatever, you know what? Who cares? I'm just here to mash the buttons. But I will not mash them buttons just yet because I've got to let Mr. Uka Uka. Uh, it's Aku Aku backwards. Get it? Because he's the good one and he's the bad one. <sighs> Scold Cortex for being a naughty dog for allowing. Let him to foil his evil plans twice, but in the process of doing so, Cortex's space station. Crash. Setting free this spooky boy from his temple prison where his twin brother Aku Aku locked him up long ago. However, with no crystals and gems left on the earth in the present day to power their worldwide conquest, Cortex and Uku Uku utilize the Time Twister machine built by Dr. Nefarious Tropi. The original Dr. Nefarious. Clarence! To retrieve crystals and gems from the past and future. <laughs> well, unless we get to them first. Unfortunately, with these new funky jumping physics, our chances of getting to them are pretty low. Okay, they're not that bad, I just needed a segue. Before, you used to be able to stop yourself in the air whenever you wanted, but now Crash will drift toward whatever direction he was initially moving, even if you try to pull him back. It's really not bad, it just takes some time getting used to, especially playing these games back to back, so it was worth mentioning to me. And hey, at least when you bounce on these crates now, you get two wampa instead of one, so that's cool. Speaking of cool, how about all the different game modes and time zones featured in the game? First off, we've got Medieval, Prehistoric, Arabian, Egyptian and futuristic levels featuring your classic Crash Bandicoot platforming. Spin, slide, and jump your way through the gauntlets gathering crystals, smashing crates, and grabbing Wumpa and doing some silky smooth moves. <laughs> oh, and don't worry, you've still got your signature chase levels, but instead of boulders, which is what we've been mainly accustomed to, except for that one time you pissed off a bear. <laughs> well, things haven't got much better for our buddy old pal Crash because now a Triceratops wants to munch on his giblets. <laughs> but I guess you could say Crash got tired of running from him in death and decided to swim with it instead in the form of Shanks. Yes, that's right, kids. You're about to go on the most okay diamond experience of your life. I mean, hey, variety's good and all that, and I appreciate Naughty Dog wanting to spice things up, but this is just... okay. Anywho! I do got a bit more to say about these bike racing levels, and it's not too good! <laughs> They're not too bad, it's just that the other racers are kinda ASSHOLES! Your motorcycle controls okay, but it could be a lot better. No matter how much you try to slow down or drift into turns, you just find yourself sliding into the desert, which the sand has always reminded me of Cool Ranch Doritos for some reason. I don't know why, can someone please HELP ME? These levels aren't all bad though, because slithering by these desert rider douchebags by the narrowest of margins on your way to victory is one of the most euphoric things I have ever experienced in a video game. But how about we talk about the complete reverse opposite? of euphoria these heckin plain levels the one with coco isn't so bad mad bombers though Oh, you know what, let's just focus more on Coco levels for now because I'm not in the mood to have an animation. <laughs> yes, as I mentioned earlier, you get to play as Coco in her own levels. Those being the plane level I already mentioned, and now the newly added jet ski levels, and she also takes over the iconic animal riding levels this time around, mounting- I can't, I can't. Like I said, the plane level, cool. All you really have to do is fly around and shoot down these blimps. This one, it's not too hard, it's just good. 
The jet ski levels are tubular. The controls are scrumptious. So you go at just the right speed. Your jet ski has just the right amount of tightness and its turns and jumps. They're an absolute boatload of fun. Except for Hot Cocoa, which is basically an open space where you go on a manhunt for crates with virtually no obstacles serving any sort of challenge. I think I had a complaint just like that for a game I'm pretty certain I've reviewed already. <laughs> levels are both endless fun from beginning to end. They're incredibly fast paces. You can run for as long as you want, smash through barrels, evade dragons, jump from rooftops. They are just so, so good. And as much as I love the polar bear levels from Crash 2, I think I lean in slight favor of these because of the pure madness they are. But don't let all these new fancy game modes distract you from just how fun Crash still is to play. You've got your signature jumps and spins and slides and Thunderfloor! But after each boss you defeat in the game, you are granted a new power-up, which all make the gameplay more dynamic. With five bosses in the game, that means you've got five new power-ups to work with. The Super Belly Flop, Double Jump, Death Tornado Spin, Fruit Bazooka, and Speed Shoes. We've got some familiar faces returning as bosses, such as Tiny, Engine, and Cortex. And we've also got newcomers Dingo Dial and Entropy, who I mentioned earlier. Tiny's fight takes place in a Roman Colosseum, where he jumps after you, kind of similar to his battle in Crash 2. We'll try to stab you with this trident before you attack him and then he will send out a hungry pack of lions after you. From here the process repeats itself until he did where you will be rewarded with the super belly flop. The super belly flop is pretty contrived considering you could practically do the same thing it was designed to do in the last game. So it just comes across as they couldn't think of another power flop, so they just retconned your regular. Up next is Dingo Dial, and boy howdy, he is a thriller. I love him! Using his flamethrower, he will shoot fireballs into the air, which will throttle down and crash his direction. After avoiding these, he will shoot fire through his crystal shield, which will give you the chance to attack. As the battle goes on, his beams become more accurate, and by the end, he'll even start shooting two fireballs at once. It's really intense and absolutely my favorite crash boss, both as a character and as a fight in the franchise up to this point. You thrashed me, mate. No worries, but you'll soon be up against much worse. I mean, come on, with lines like that, how can't you love them? And how can't you love a good shortcut? Look how easy it actually is to beat this jump. <laughs> Thrashing Totodile will grant you the double jump ability, which is pretty fun and also pretty self-explanatory. So moving on to the master of time and space. Poor guy has no idea what he's in for. Entropy uses his giant fork thingy to shoot fireballs and lasers at Crash. After avoiding the obstacles, he'll slam his fork thingy into the ground, knocking the wind out of himself, creating a path for you to jump across and attack. Repeat this three times over and you've got yourself the DEATH TORNADO SPIN, which is my favorite power-up in the game. The DEATH TORNADO SPIN acts not only as a longer spin attack, but also as a glide maneuver for Crash to surpass large platforming gaps, which is inherently satisfying. Well, you want to talk about really satisfying? Engine's boss battle here is glorious. For one thing, it's a two-phase battle, which we haven't seen from Crash Bandicoot before. Kinda. Where after defeating Engine's mech the first time, it transforms into another mech. Secondly, it takes place on the moon. And finally, it's Coco piloting a spaceship versus a giant mech, which shoots homing missiles, homing bombs, plasma balls, and has a death machine straight out of Call of Duty. And it's only fitting that the power-up you receive for defeating him is a fruit bazooka. And it's as cool as you'd expect. So you really have to use it. But then again, you don't really have to use any of these power-ups, do you? Stupid, 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 stupid. Remember how stupid Cortex's battle was in Crash 2? Well, he's made quite a comeback from last time. I mean, he's still the third or fourth best boss in the game. But hey, considering all of these bosses have actually been pretty good for a change, and he was literally one of the worst boss battles of all time in Crash 2, yeah, that's a good little spot for him. So the Mask Brothers start off in a beam struggle weeb style, while Cortex throws mines on the ground which you have to dodge until you make his way over to thump him into this black hole, only for him to rise back up and HOLY SHIT! And then the two masks do this tornado thing while Cortex tries to shoot you with his ray gun, starts throwing mines again, black hole time, Oh hi Mark! Explosions, more mines, more spins, DEAD! Granting you the final power up of the game, the speed shoes, which are used to help you complete the newly added post game challenge, time trial mode. Time trial mode is very 
very simple but can be infuriatingly difficult. Grab the clock at the beginning of a level to race to the end as fast as you can to get one of the three rankings of relics. Sapphire, which are the easiest to retrieve since you could practically get them from playing blind and with no hands. Yeah, Gold, which leave room for you to make a couple mistakes but you still gotta stay sharp. And then there's platinum. And let me tell you, if you like your sanity right where it belongs, I would advise staying away from these at all costs. And they're not even necessary for 105% completion, you only need the gold relics, so yeah. Don't hurt yourself like I did years ago. Remember how I said I'd wait to talk about Mad Bombers? Well now is that time, because the time trial is absolutely maniacal! I spent what felt like an eternity in pure agony over this crap! Only to get a sapphire relic by the most minuscule amount. So you bet your ass when I finally got that gold relic, I got clobbered to celebrate. Regardless of that baloney, the time trials are an interesting addition. They're a logical, practical extension to the game. Would I call them fun? Yes and no. It's a love-hate relationship. While it's so much fun to blitz through levels, once you fail, you come crashing down like a stone. But your ego just won't let you give up, so once you do win, it's a fantastic, addictive feeling. Once you retrieve 5 relics of any ranking, you'll notice a platform will spawn in the middle of the time twister machine. Jump on in and it'll take you to a secret warp room below the machine where for every 5 relics you win, you will gain access to a new level or a gateway to a secret area of a previous level. Which by the way, remember how I said Crash 2 had hidden warps to new levels or sections of levels in my previous review? Go check it out if you haven't seen it. Well, they're back in Crash 3 and they're... Crash 2 used clever level design to provoke you to question why certain areas appeared the way they did. Why is there a staircase of nitro? Why are there random little icebergs floating here? Why is this gap extending out from the chasm? All these little details dared you to take risks you couldn't resist taking and you felt smarter for figuring these things out. Hot Cocoa is one of those levels in Crash 3. You want to know how you find it? By running over a very specifically planted sign in one of the racing levels. Agapus Rex is another secret level. Want to know how you access that? By being, air quotes, killed by this very specific pterodactyl in this very specific yellow gem root. Why would anyone in their right mind think, hmm, that pterodactyl looks awfully suspicious? You wouldn't! You would find this stuff by complete accident, and maybe that was Naughty Dog's intention to blow your mind when you think you're dead or you messed up or whatever, you get transported to this new world. I don't know. But if so, I think that's just a mistake on their part and takes away part of what made Crash 2 so rewarding to play. Anyway, unlocking all of these levels, of course, gives you the opportunity to retrieve all the gems and relics, and retrieving all of which will get you to 105%. Once you reach that, defeat Cortex again and you will be treated to a bonus ending where the time twister machine gives in on itself because Entropy is not around to keep it stabilized, which is nice foreshadowing followed up on from before. Without Dr. Entropy's constant care and control, who knows what it will do? This sends Cortex, Entropy, and Uka Uka through what is presumably an infinite wormhole through time as... babies? Alright, cool. And hey, Josh Mansell's pretty cool. He's got some sick new tunes on the block. The best yet! Overall, Crash Bandicoot War! is a fantastic game. It's got beautiful level variety, awesome bosses, great music, cool villains who taunt you throughout the game, fun power-ups, engaging time trials, it's got all the goods you could want from a Crash Bandicoot game. Unfortunately, as fun as the power-ups are, they feel a bit tacked on since you never really have to go back to old levels to access areas you couldn't before just because of your lack of power-ups. But most importantly, some of the game modes are just... What? And have me wanting to simply play as good old Crash, which is a big deal since 15 of the 30 levels are strictly not Crash gameplay. Albeit 6 of those 15 are 2 game modes I really enjoy, but that's still a third of the game, leaving quite a bit left to be desired for me. Again, Crash Bandicoot 3. Yeah, that's right, you thought I was gonna do the thing, didn't you? 
is still a great, great game, which I will play dozens of times over for the rest of my life, but despite all the great things Crash 3 did, I do have to lean slightly in favor of Crash Bandicoot 2 as my all-time favorite Crash game, but hey, that's just personal preference. Join me next time to see what Spyro Year of the Dragon had in store as the final installment of the Spyro trilogy, and if it could succeed or crash, I'd feel a bit short as the trilogy's final entry. Alright fellas, the deed is done. I am sorry to have kept this video waiting for so long, but uh, I posted an update on Twitter and long story short, life basically kicked me in the balls, and then when I was hunched over, it kneed me in the face, and then when I hunched back, it proceeded to kick me in the balls again. Hope the video was worth the wait and I will get that Spyro 3 video cranked out as soon as possible. Love you all.